The twins looked into each other's eyes and nodded in unison. They knew what needed to be done and were comfortable in the fact they had nothing to lose but their reputation. This big northern monster had dared disrespect them in their own unit and was about to find out why the brothers were the most notorious figures in the prison system. Professional boxers, certified killers with a generous dose of insanity meant that together they were a scary proposition for the toughest of men. To set the scene, this is pre-1978 when both brothers were in prison before Ronnie was shipped out to Broadmoor for reasons that will come apparent. A notorious scouser is shipped into prison after being uncontrollably violent in other prisoners. I would now give respected former life in Norman Parker's version of these brutal events from his book, The Complete Parker's Tales. Scouse Roy, as his nickname suggests, came from Liverpool and in the early 70s there were very few sophisticated robbery firms in that city. Those that did exist would never have dreamed of having Roy as a member. He was a thug, plain and simple. He didn't like bottle, but like life, all his robberies were nasty, brutish and short. He would never take something by wit or stealth if he could cosh someone and grab it. By virtue of this fact, he was regarded by the Liverpool Old Bill as a major criminal. His 11 and a half year sentence was short by security weighing standards, but then he was a control problem rather than a security risk. Roy was a right handful. He had been the daddy of every ball store he'd ever been in, and he had been in most of the tough ones. He was just naturally big, strong and vicious. He had showed some early talent for boxing, and if he'd have stuck with it, there was a chance he could have been a very good. Now in his early 30s, it was too late. Its legacy, though, was a broad-shouldered, bull-like man with a partially hunched back who could fight like anything. He was not un unintelligent, it was just that he saw most things in terms of brute force. Why bother to try to convince someone when you can make them do it by force? There were rumours that he had been in Rampton on a previous sentence. He was certainly regarded as a nutter by people who had lived with nutters all their lives. At the start of this sentence, he had smashed a screw over the head with a full bucket of porridge, then showered him with the scalding contents. It was a miracle that the screw hadn't been seriously injured, because a full porridge bucket weighed all of £40. Roy was taken to an outside court and was very lucky to get only six months on top of the 11 years he was already doing. Transferred to Hull, he had then hit a hard knock jock over the head with a hammer. The fellow was seriously injured and a screw had seen it happen. At the subsequent VC, Roy lost a couple of hundred days remission and got 28 days bang up. They wanted him out of Hull, so Roy duly arrived at Parker's security wing with most of his bang up still to do. No doubt the authorities thought that the liberal regime and close supervision would slow this wild man down a bit. They were right after a fashion, but it didn't happen quite in the way they thought it would. The security wing was very small as prison wings go. Within five minutes of Roy's arrival, everyone knew of him. A couple of people saw the screws bring him onto the wing with his kit. They saw him taken to an empty cell and locked him. This was unusual, because every other new arrival had been allowed to circulate once he had moved in. The screws told a couple of people that he was on punishment. He would be allowed out to mix when he had finished it. This news soon reached Ronnie. Now in many ways, Ron was a very honourable man. He had strong beliefs as to how a man ought to be behave. This wasn't just a philosophical exercise on his part. It translated into positive action. He believed that certain things were an obligation. The thought of a fellow con being locked behind his door on punishment troubled him. He felt that he had a clear duty to do something. It wasn't just a question of hospitality. It was much more than that. Ronnie collected together coffee, tea, sugar, milk and several packs of biscuits. He got a screw to open Roy's door and handed a lot to him. He introduced himself briefly before the screw locked the door again. Then he sat in the doorway talking to Roy through the locked door. Over the next couple of weeks, Ronnie was to be regularly seen talking to Roy through the door. It was an act of kindness to a fellow con in solitary confinement. Roy wouldn't have seen it like that though. All his relationships were based solely on dominance and submission. He couldn't conceive of one base based on kindness and a sense of duty. He was aware that in purely criminal terms, his career was rapidly becoming quite spectacular. The obscure Scouse Robert had done a screw, hammered a hard nut jock, 
and been transferred to England's top security wing. Now he had Ronnie Cray sitting on his doorstep, keeping him company against the loneliness of solitary. He must have felt that he had finally really arrived to receive such an act of homage. Time eventually passed and Roy's punishment came to an end. He was let out to mix freely with the rest of the wing's inhabitants. As far as Ronnie was concerned, duty had been done and duty didn't extend to make him Roy a permanent member of his small social circle. He would have to make his own way on the wing now. Ronnie went back to his usually daily round of sitting in his cell in the company of Reg and Joe with occasional visits from Neil. Roy, however, took to dropping into Ron's cell whenever he felt like it. This was especially irksome to Ron, first thing in the morning. He was on heavy psychotropic medication, which played havoc with his moods. The only people he would allow to come near him then were Reg and Joe. At first he just asked Roy not to come in early in the mornings. Roy persisted. Then Ron wrote Roy a short letter and put it in his cell. In it, he explained that he liked to be with only Reg and Joe first thing and would Roy mind not coming in. Ron was sitting quietly in his cell with Reg when Roy suddenly burst in. He had Ron's note in his hand. Who do you twats think you are? He shouted. I don't want to effing sit with you anyway. With that, he crumpled the note, threw it at Ron and stormed out. He had just made a very serious mistake. There were very few potential weapons lying about in the security wing. For obvious reasons. Those that are available are of the homemade variety. That night Ron and Reg emptied out two large glass sauce bottles then they carefully smashed them. The result was two necks ended in two wickedly jagged ends. The following morning the screws unlocked the wing as usual. Roy never got up for breakfast and still lay in his bed sleeping. Suddenly his door burst open and in rushed Ron and Reg the broken bottles in their hands. Ron pulled the covers off Roy, then jumped across him to sit on his chest. He immediately began slashing and gouging at his face. At the same time, Reg jumped across his legs and slashed at his exposed stomach. Roy thrashed about, but the combined weight of the twins pinned him to the bed. One moment he had been dozing peacefully, now he was fighting for his life. A third shadow fell across his doorway as Neil ran in. He had a homemade spear fashioned out of a broomstick with a jagged piece of glass taped to the end, which he repeatedly plunged into Roy's side. Screams and angry shouts filled the air. Blood sprayed over the covers, over the walls and over all four men. Ronnie and Neil were in a complete frenzy. Alerted by the rumpus, Joe ran into the cell. He quickly took stock of the gory scene. Roy thrashing about on the bed in a welter of blood. Looked like a lump of butcher's meat. They were certainly going to kill him if they hadn't done so already. Joe grabbed Neil and threw him bodily out of the cell. Then he grabbed Reggie's arm, shouting, Reg, you're going to kill him. Help me stop Ron. Ron dropped the bloodstained bottle. He realised that Joe wasn't doing this for Roy, but for him and his brother. Together they got hold of Ron. He was completely gone, hacking and slashing at the gory mess that had become Roy's face. Slowly he became aware of their voices. He struggled in their grip, almost involuntary. Finally, he allowed himself to be pulled from the bed. By now, there were several screws outside the door. Dozens more were pouring into the wing, but it was all over. This was just as well, as far as the screws outside Roy's cell were concerned. When they had seen who was involved, they had stopped where they were. Now, with the chiefs and the POs running into the wing, they would have to do something. Joe and Red let out a blood splattered run. The screws let them take him to his cell. The wing PO and SO had been both arrived by now. After some hesitation, they went into Roy's cell. The SO immediately reappeared. He shouted at a nearby screw who was carrying a radio to call the hospital. They would need medical staff and a stretcher. A white jacketed hospital screw was already on the landing. He pushed his way through the group of screws and went into Roy's cell after the SO. There was very little they could do. Roy lay naked on a blood soaked sheet, writhing in agony and shock. The few white parts of the sheet made the thick blood stain stand out in the stark contrast. He was bleeding from so many cuts and slashes that blood covered him from head to toe. They tried to get him to lie still. Within five minutes, four hospital screws arrived. Seconds later, they reappeared with Roy, Roy on a stretcher, wrapped in the blood-soaked sheet. They took him straight to the prison hospital. This is equipped to handle major operations, 
there was ample facilities to deal with Roy's injuries. Back at the security wing, the PO and SO had gone to Ron's cell. They pushed the door open and stood in the doorway. Ron, Reg and Joe sat there, all of them covered in blood. You'll have to go to the block, boys, until all this is sorted out, said the PO. Reg stood up. Joe had nothing to do with this, he said. It was me and Ron. With that, Ron stood up too, and they both walked out of the cell. So that was an interesting story, I thought, on the craze and the row they had in uh, Parkhurst. I'd never heard that story before. I'm sure people who were really into the craze and all that kind of thing knew about it. But it wasn't one that I'd come across. And I was reading Norman Parker, who was a serious geezer back in the days, past now, um, talking about it. And then I thought, is this just another one of them made up for the book? Because I can't remember reading anything about it or sort of in any of the books that I read. So I did a bit of research in the archives and I found found the, the news reports about the attack. So it did happen <laughs> and it looked like it's pretty accurate what Parker said about it. You know, you can say what you want about the craze and whether the wrongings, you know, and that type of thing, but they were definitely dangerous, 110%. Um, and I guess that's why they moved Ronnie to Broadmoor in. That was in 73, I think, that happened. Um, then they were both put in a psychiatric unit for a while. I'm not sure if that was part of Parkhurst. And then Ronnie later on was moved to, I think it was in 78, Broadmoor. So I hope you enjoyed that. Just a little bit of news. I've signed up now for a company, Audio Boom, whom put long form podcast material out onto iTunes and Spotify. So that's in progress at the moment. And I've got some really, really good 30 to 45 minute long um, stories and different episodes, which I've created from scratch, which I'll be doing on those channels. They'll be coming out on them first and possibly on YouTube after. Um, so I'll keep you in the loop about those but if you've got spotify and all those type of things i'll send the links once it's all up and running um and i might even the book that i'm writing i may even upload a chapter at a time as well um so my subscribers and followers can read it on the go if you like before it gets properly edited and um published Okay, with that being said, if you can smash the likes out, until next time, that's me out.